We held those hearings in order to try to understand what we needed to do. And those who testified said the model is right in that it, you need to involve the entire watershed areas. You need to have local plans, maintain the local initiatives. And yes, you need to have enforcement. And they urged us to look at the Clean Air Act as a model for how you can enforce the standards that you set up. But they also said we need help. We need help because good science tells us we can do a lot better job on storm runoff, but we don't have any programs that really provide the resources in the Bay watershed. So one of the principal parts of the legislation that I've introduced provides $1.5 billion of new authorized grants to the watershed areas so that we can deal with the runoff issue. So we can make a difference. So that the local officials can tell their developers, we can do something to help you in dealing with the proper way for development and mitigating the impact of runoff. That we can tell our local governments that when you do public construction, you can do a better job on dealing with runoff, whether it's a road or a building. And certainly the federal government, which is starting to change its way on runoff. We've gotten legislation passed where they need to deal with this now. Are starting to be better understand what we could do on the runoff issues. So the legislation that has been introduced will provide $1.5 billion of new authorization. Well, it provides some additional tools. And I want to talk about the nutrient trading program, which is authorized under this legislation. The nutrient trading program allows us to use the market to get the results in the most cost-effective, efficient way. We did this for sulfur dioxide in 1990 in the Clean Air Act amendments. And there were a lot of skeptics. I remember this. I was here. I remember this happening. And people say, oh, it won't work. It'll be manipulated. It's actually going to cost more money. Well, the verdict's in. It's saved between 43 and 55 percent on the cost of the program because we used a trading program for sulfur dioxide. We now have an independent economic analysis on the Chesapeake Bay on a nutrient trading program. By the way, Pennsylvania has it and it's worked there. But the Water Resources Institute tells us that a nutrient trading program should reduce the amount of nutrients in the Bay by 145 million pounds per year. That's what the economic incentives should produce. That's 70 million pounds more than it's estimated that's needed to stabilize the Bay ecosystem. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that 70 million dollars will enter into the marketplace and be used for offsets, principally by local governments that need to have offsets in order to be able to go forward with development. And that means that we will have two results as a result of this nutrient tra trading program. One is that the farmers will have a revenue flow that they don't have today. And I've talked to many farmers who say, you know, life is unpredictable for us. We can't predict the weather. We can't predict the international marketplace. That affects our price. It'd be nice to have more stability in pricing. We try to do that in the farm bill. But here it gives them a revenue source. They do the right thing. They can get money as a result of it. The other issue that the farmers talked to us about was, okay, be nice to be able to manage and, and do what, the right buffer zones, et cetera, but we don't have somebody on our farming staff who has the technical ex experience to know how to deal with that. We need help. We need technical assistance. Well, this bill, the bill that I've introduced and, and Congressman Cummings have introduced, will provide a 20 percent of the implementation grants will be set aside to help the farming community with technical assistance. We're providing them the tools. We protect those farmers who've already done the right thing. I've heard that many, many times. I know that there are farmers in my state who responded to the call from Governor Hughes and from subsequent administrations to say, be the right sorts of the bay. They did. They put in the buffer zones. They're rewarded under this bill, not penalized. 
But the best way that we can reward those who have done the right thing, whether it is in the way that they handle development or the way that they've handled their wastewater treatment or the way that they've handled their agricultural community, the best thing we can do for those who've already done the right thing is to require everyone to do the right thing so that we can accomplish the results that we set out to do. That's the best thing we can do to help those farmers who have already made the sacrifices and those communities that have already put in the right type of development standards. The legislation is modeled after the Clean Air Act. It's modeled after the Clean Air Act and it sets a firm date of, of 2025 for all restoration efforts to be in place. But doesn't just set the date 2025, it sets up a process for every two years for the plans to be reviewed to make sure that we in fact accomplish the goals that are set out in the legislation. These are state plans that are developed. State plans. We maintain local control over the program. That's why Governor Kane and Governor O'Malley are strong supporters of this bill. They believe it should be local control because it's up to the local governments to put the different interests together. All are responsible parties, all are participating, but to figure out how is the best way to balance what needs to be done in the agricultural community, development community, and the other areas that are impacted by the uh, Bay program. So there are state programs and state actions reviewed every two years to make sure that we accomplish the results by 2025. And yes, there is an EPA backup. If it doesn't get the job done, there is enforcement as there is under the Clean Air Act. It codifies the total maximum daily loads, the process that was established basically because it's legally required. The Canoe Association case 10 years ago pointed out that there's a responsibility to deal with the water quality of the bay. So we build on President Obama's commitment on the bay. I want to stress the fact that my legislation builds on the local control of the program, gives the local governments the necessary tools to get the job done, includes the entire watershed so that we're all involved in this, includes all sectors that have responsibility concerning the clean water of the bay, is based upon the best science information we have available, reviewed every two years to make sure we stay on target, giving sufficient time in order to bring about compliance so that there's sufficient lead time to accomplish the goals and ensures that the goals are met. Well, to me, that's a reasonable approach to deal with this. It's the right way to move to the next chapter. So, what's the problem here? Why isn't this being embraced by more people, particularly in the Bay region? They understand the importance of the Chesapeake Bay. So why aren't they as enthusiastic as you are in getting this done? And I'm going to tell you, I really think it's not opposition coming from the interests in the watershed area. I believe this is national opposition. These are people who really don't understand the importance of the Chesapeake Bay to the life of the people of our region. These are people who just don't understand that a clean environment is good for our economy. And they sort of look at their balance sheets for this year and don't look into the future and don't realize the responsibility that each one of us have to future generations. So it's, it's the national farm bureaus, it's the national chambers of commerce that are generating the type of opposition. I'm not sure the national chamber is against, I shouldn't say the national chamber, but I know the builders are showing concern and are energizing our local people as part of their next generation of uh, the Federal Partnership on the Chesapeake Bay. Is